Okay, we are here to talk about chapter 26, real property. Real property is land and the buildings on that land. Personal property is anything else. Personal property is your neighbor's wheelbarrow. Personal property is the table your computer may be sitting on. Personal property is that old high school football jersey you have in the drawer. All of that is personal property. But we're here today to talk about real property. The owner of land and the buildings on that land also usually has ownership of the airspace above the land up until about 500 feet where the FAA takes over. Now, of course, underneath the land, there are often valuable minerals depending on what state you are in. And the ownership of those minerals underneath the land may very well be uh, owned by someone different than the person that owns the, the surface of the land. Let's talk about fixtures. A fixture is something so attached to the land or a building on the land that it is considered part of real property. If you would go and buy yourself a house and you bought it, you bought it by looking at it online and you went to the act of sale and you were so excited and you got the keys and you went into the new home and you realized that somebody had taken all the toilets out and the sink out and the kitchen cabinets out. Well, those are fixtures and they are part of the real property. So if you ever buy some property, be sure you specify uh, those gray areas about fixtures as in do, do blinds on the, on, the, on, the, on the windows come with the property or not. Does that easily detached window air conditioner come with the property or not? So put that in your, in your act of sale. Way back in oldie English days, when everybody knew that the king owned everything, basically even including the people in, people in, in England, they had to come up with a term to mean you own everything except for the fact that, of course, the king owns the whole country. And that term for owning a piece of property is fee, simple, absolute, three words. Sometimes it's simply known as fee simple, but that's the greatest amount of ownership that a person can have. Let's talk about another type of ownership, a life estate. If you grant a life estate or sell a life estate, that means you're granting to someone the right to use your, your property as if it's theirs for their life. So if you want to give to your friend uh, your estate in Tacoma, Washington for his life, then you'd say, I'm giving you or I'm selling you a life estate. And that, that property remains yours, but he or she can use it as long as that person is still alive. Once they die, that property reverts to you. Let's talk about a rental situation. You're renting some real estate and you have a tenancy, that's T-E-N-A-N-C-Y, a tenancy for years. Don't be confused by the term years. It really means for a term. It could be six months, it could be five years, it could be 47 weeks. If you've got a tenancy for a period of time as a rental, a real estate rental, it's a tenancy for years. Let's say you've got an apartment for a year and after that year, the lease runs out and you just keep paying the rent and the landlord keeps accepting it, then you've got a tenancy at will, okay? In that case, uh, if you're in a tenancy at will situation, each state has a required amount of days or weeks that the tenant or the landlord can give to the other to get them out of the property. Let's talk about uh, two other types of ownership of real estate. One is called joint tenancy, and the other is called tenancy in common. If two people, let's say a husband and wife, buy a piece of property in joint tenancy, when one of them dies, the other one, the surviving spouse, retains the property, the full ownership of the property, once the first spouse dies. No going through probate, nothing like that. If you own the property in joint tenancy, the survivor owns it all once the first one dies. 
On the flip side of that, if you own property, two people, as tenants in common or in tenancy in common, then when one person dies, that person's heirs own their half of the property and the original half owner owns his or her half of the property. Let's talk about community property because community property applies in these states. Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana, and Nevada, and to some lesser extent in Alaska and Wisconsin. Community property is a type of regime of ownership for married people. If two people are married in those states, unless, unless they choose to remove themselves from the community property regime, in those states, when married people acquire property, whether it's real property or wages or personal property, they own it in community property. The best way I can describe it is, let's say that um, in a marriage situation, the the uh, one one spouse makes a million dollars and the other stays at home. Well, they both own. $500,000 of that million. It doesn't matter who makes the money. You own it half and half. Okay, let's talk about non-possessory interest or easements. An easement is a right you have over somebody else's property. Let's say you're very wealthy and you've got an estate out there on a uh, on a rural highway and you decide that you're going to buy the biggest motor home you can find and you drive it home and you realize you can't turn it into your driveway without going over a little piece of your neighbor's property so you go to your neighbor and you'd say i'd like to buy an easement over this little piece of your property to give me the right to drive my motor home over it as I'm getting into the driveway. Your neighbor continues to own that property, but you have a right to use it for a particular purpose, in this case to drive your motor home over. When you drive down the interstate and see those electric wires extending off into the distance forever, the farmer has granted the electric company an easement to have those poles on the property. The farmer still owns the property, the electric company has the right to have the poles there. Restrictive covenants uh, allow an owner of property put, to put a certain restriction on the entirety of the property forever. You might want to look in your textbook about that. There are many legitimate uses of restrictive covenants. Let's talk about eminent domain. Eminent, eminent domain is the right of the government under the United States Constitution, Amendment 5, to take your property if they're going to use it for a public purpose and pay you full value therefore. I'm sitting right now in the evening on the campus of Loyola University, New Orleans. If the Louisiana Department of Highways comes into the Loyola President's office tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and says, we're building a new interstate, it's going to completely take over uh, Loyola's campus. Here's a check, Mr. President, for the full value of the campus. The president has nothing to say because a road is a, is, a, is a public use and he's getting full value for the property. Too bad, so sad. The government now owns the property. That state, federal, or local government can exercise eminent domain over your property. The last thing in the chapter is about zoning. Zoning is, of course, the way land can be used, real estate can be used, and generally the types of zoning in a community are residential, commercial, industrial, in some counties agricultural zoning, and you've got to comply with those zoning restrictions. And um, so that's it for the uh, real estate chapter, but I did want to mention there is an interesting fun video on fixtures. You might want to look at that. Great.